welcome back to the Missing Sock Corner of the World Storytelling Cafe for another episode of Kingdom 1000. I am storyteller and folklorist Chip Cahoon, and I am really pleased to have you back here with us as we explore the 1,000-year origins, the 1,000-year-old origins. Can origins be 1,000 years old? I'm confusing myself. Equal rights is 1,000 years old this year, 2020, and that's what we are celebrating. We're having a big party to celebrate the fact that although our journey towards equal rights and human rights isn't over, as this fly clearly wants to say, we have come a long way, and that is something really worth celebrating. We've got some fantastic people around us to help celebrate. I'm going to introduce you to one of my favorite people in the world in just a moment. But before I go too far, I do want to just acknowledge that today is the 11th of August. That means it is... I think six years since we lost Robin Williams, who is also somebody who I had huge admiration for and was a major influence in my early years, as I'm sure he was to many. And the way his life ended is a real testament to just how far we've yet to go with equal rights and human rights. The fact that there are still people who are suffering, who don't feel that they are able to speak out or be heard, even people in the public eye like Robin was. So I've always seen the 11th of August as Robin Williams Day to remember the amazing amount of creativity and fun and joy that he brought to so many lives, the inspiration that he's given to so many. And I hope that we can reflect a little bit of that in today's episode of Kingdom 1000 as well. So someone else who has been giving so much joy and entertainment to many uh, and so much advice and inspiration uh, was there right at the start of my storytelling journey as well is our guest today and that I hope is the guest who is going to appear on the screen when I press this button. Well hello there you are, John Rowe. Hello, Chip, and everyone else, uh, wherever you are. It's really good to have you here with us. John is a spoken word artist in all sorts of forms, although, well, I've, I've heard you tell stories and I've heard you, I've heard you recite poetry. Do you sing? No, um, that's the reason I'm a spoken word artist. <laughs> okay, so definitely spoken word as opposed to sung word. Absolutely but a wordsmith through and through. And we're delighted to have you here, John, because not only are you the curator of uh, the spoken word areas in festivals like Cambridge Folk Festival and the Kids Field at Glastonbury and probably loads of others as well. I'm only mentioning the ones that I know personally because you've, you've very kindly curated me into those festivals. Um, but uh, you... You also um, have been a storyteller and a wordsmith, and you've curated the World Storytelling Cafe as well. Am I right? That is true. It's been an amazing experience, and it's brought me in friends all over the world. And there, there is, within the equality theme, I, I think there's a certain thing that we've been able to do with... Um, in lockdown, because we're doing so much online, people don't have to buy plane tickets to go and see people, and uh, you know, and and certain things have become a lot more accessible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's absolutely right, and it's absolutely amazing. I think how there are gadgets now that can take the the electricity bubbling about in my brain that's knocking particles through the air to this tiny little device somewhere over the other side of the room to me which is turning them into other signals beaming them to a satellite beaming them to you beaming them back to romania beaming them all around the world so that people can pick it up it, it it's really beautiful really what we've been able to accomplish for equality um through through the technology that we have today 
Um, and it's because, of course, John is such uh, a, a leading light uh, and a leading figure in the storytelling community that we collectively agreed that we would not try to make his head any smaller um, or my, my head any bigger. It's absolutely right that he takes up as much of the screen as he does right now. So, <laughs> John, can I start by asking you, as I've asked to everybody so far, what, what actually does equality mean to you? Well, I think it, it, it's actually it's something we strive for. It's, uh, it's something... Because wherever I go, certain things have improved, but there's wherever we go, there is so much more to do. Mm. Uh, I mean, I spent a lot of my life as a uh, as a resident writer in prisons, and I see the results in there. Uh, it probably stands out more of inequality. So I'm con mm. I'm I'm constantly conscious of inequality, but I'm also aware that we. That like we we have been, I think, as a global community, if you take it together, striving towards this ideal. You know, there's. I, I think it's important to have a utopian vision. Absolutely, absolutely, and. I, I couldn't have put it better. To be honest, you're absolutely right. It is a journey, and it's a journey that's taking place. All, all around the world. Some people are further along it than others. And if you are further along it, then it's important to set the example and leave the record and, and the signposts to help others along. Um, because again, that's, that's inherent within the idea of equality, isn't it? That we're all here to help each other um, as, as a... I think it's that, it's, that basic, it's that basic thing. We help each other, but it's mm. also... Um, but the the one of the difficulties is uh, is trying to achieve equality and at the same time respecting other people's beliefs and but also questioning them as well. Mm. So it's it's also you know it's a constant uh, matter. It, you know if you feel that someone else's beliefs are oppressing someone else, then question them, but question them in a respectful way. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And as we've been going through the, the world that led to the uh, establishment of the very first equal rights law 1,000 years ago, we've been meeting various different races. We've, we've met the Danes already. We've met uh, the Angles. We've met the Saxons. And so it, it was very much uh, an island on Britain quite similar to the world that we have now. Lots of different nationalities, different religions, different uh, customs in such close proximity. And as we go through this series, we're going to see how that eventually gave rise to the really important law that we are celebrating from 1000 years ago. And one of the places in Britain that has a lovely rich story to help us explore this is Chester, which was in the kingdom back then of Mercia. England didn't exist over 1000 years ago. It was a kingdom called Mercia. And this is where a lot of the, I think this was where the Angles lived and also some of the Danes as well. After, after Alfred had um, beaten back the Danes, he managed to keep them in one side of the kingdom or one side of the island called well, we call it now the Dane law. They didn't really call it that back then. But Mercia was such a large area, it actually got split between the Danish on one side and the uh, Angles on the other. And from that period, we have such wonderful stories about the queen of the Mercians or the lady of the Mercians, Ethel Flaed. We're going to hear that story right now. So uh, if you'd like to sit back and enjoy, this is the story of the defense of Chester. The city of Chester was in the kingdom of Mercia, on the west side, which is where the English lived. Even so, there were some Vikings living in Chester in the year 902. These were Vikings who had come over from Ireland, 
they'd fallen out with their king, and they'd arrived at Chester asking the queen there, Lady Ethelfled, if she could give them a home. And she had very kindly said yes. And so there in Chester, the Irish Vikings lived alongside the English, and it seemed like it was a very happy kingdom to live in. But over on the east side of Mercia, that was where the Danish Vikings had made their home. And they were looking for any opportunity to take over the west side and follow up on their father Guthrum's plan to subdue all of the English. As soon as the Danish learned that some Irish were living in Chester, they thought this was their chance. So some Danish soldiers went and hid in the forests that surrounded the walls of the city of Chester. And they sent spies into the city to call out the Irish so that together they could make a plan to take down Lady Ethel Fled and rule the city of Chester and dominate the English. The thing was that the Irish kind of liked Lady Ethel Fled. She'd given them a home after all. She'd been very kind to them. And so, while the Danish were asleep, some of the Irish slipped back into the city of Chester to warn Lady Ethelfled and her soldiers what the Danish were planning. The next day, the Danish soldiers arrived at the city walls to find, rather to their surprise, that the guards weren't anywhere to be seen. Conquering the city of Chester was going to be a hop, a skip and a jump. The Vikings merrily walked through the city gates straight into an ambush. All of Lady Ethelfled's soldiers were there waiting for them to charge at them and chase them all the way back into the forest. But Vikings don't give up that easily. They may have been beaten once, but now they had learned their lesson. This time, they got some ladders, and they determined to put those ladders against the side of Chester's city walls, climb up to the top, and drop down on the English soldiers inside, pointing their swords at them. The very next day, the guards were up along the top of Chester's city walls when they saw the Viking Danish coming out from the forest, carrying those ladders, and they knew exactly what they wanted to do. They ran to Lady Ethelfled and said, Oh Lady, oh Lady, what are we going to do? And Lady Ethelfled thought for a moment, and then said, Gather up everyone in the kingdom and tell them to bring old bits of furniture that they, they don't really want anymore. Tables, chairs, and and anything, wardrobes, just bring them to the city walls. A short while later, the Danish had their ladders leaned against the side of Chester's city walls and were climbing up, ready with their swords. When an English guard poked his head out over the top and said, here, have a seat. Suddenly, chairs were raining down on the Danish. They couldn't hold on to the ladders with really heavy bits of furniture landing on their heads. So they let go and went crashing to the ground with a huge bump. And then they turned and they ran all the way back into the forest. But Vikings don't give up that easily. And although they had been sent back twice, well, they had learned their lesson. This time, they were still going to lean the ladders up and go up with swords ready to drop down on the English inside. But the first Vikings to climb the ladders were going to carry shields. So they would be protected from any heavy objects raining down on top of them. And the following day, as the Viking Danish came out from the forest approaching the city walls of Chester, carrying their ladders and their swords and their shields, the guards of Chester saw them coming and knew exactly what they were planning. So they rushed to Lady Ethelfled and said, Oh Lady, what are we going to do? Lady Ethelfled thought for a moment and then said, 
go and find the makers of the mead and tell them to get their drink nice and warm. Now, if you haven't heard of mead, that was one of the favourite drinks of English and Danish and Irish and, in fact, pretty much everybody who lived on the island of Britain at the time. It was a nice, warm, hot drink that you made with honey. And so, many of the people who made mead were also beekeepers. And, at Ethelfled's command, they brought many barrels of mead to these city walls. And with them also, brought cauldrons, so they could start warming it up until it was bubbling and boiling. Meanwhile, the Danish were leaning their ladders against the side of the city walls and were beginning to climb up with the Vikings holding shields heading up first. But as they got close, a little English head popped out over the city walls and said, Here! Thirsty! And before the Danish knew it, the English were pouring buckets of boiling hot mead down onto their shields. Now the boiling hot mead didn't bounce off like a chair might have done. Instead it stuck to those metal shields and they began to get scalding hot, too hot for the Danish holding them to keep their grip. They had to let go and as they let go of the shield it collapsed on their head, meaning that they let go of the ladder and they fell down onto the Danish below them who fell down onto the Danish below them, who fell down onto the Danish below them, and soon they had all landed on the ground with a very heavy bump. After this, they got up and they ran back in to the forest. But Vikings don't give up that easily. And even though they had been defeated thrice, they had learned their lessons. They knew what they had to do this time. They took their metal shields and they wrapped them in leather. So even if you poured boiling hot mead on them, they weren't going to get scalding hot. They weren't going to drop them, not this time. And the very next day, the Danish left the forest carrying their ladders and their swords and their shields wrapped in leather. When they were spotted, by the English guards who were stationed along the walls of Chester, those guards ran down to Lady Ethelfled and explained to her what they could see, and then said, Lady, what are we going to do? Well, Lady Ethelfled thought for a moment, and then she said, Go and find the makers of the mead and bring them to the city walls. But the English guards replied, Lady, we, we've tried that, but, but like we said, they, they've wrapped their metal shields in leather. But Lady Ethelfled just said, Don't worry, we're not going to be giving them mead this time. Meanwhile, the Danish had brought their ladders up to the walls of the city of Chester and had leaned them against it and were climbing up again, ready to drop down on the English on the inside, aiming their swords at them pointy end first. And the Danish climbing up first had their shields held aloft, wrapped in leather to protect them from boiling hot mead. When suddenly, the head of an English guard poked up over the top of the city walls and said, uh, <clears throat> this might sting a little. And before the Danish knew it, the English soldiers were dropping beehives down on their heads. Now when the beehives crashed down on those shields, all of the bees came out and they were very angry. And an angry bee will usually sting the closest object near it, which in this case were the Danish Vikings. The Danish found it very difficult to hold on to a ladder with stings going on all over their bodies and before they knew it they were falling down on the Danish below them who were falling down on the Danish below them who were falling down on the Danish below them and they all hit the ground with a heavy bump and they turned around and they ran off through the forest they kept on going and they didn't stop 
because a Viking doesn't give up that easily. But neither did Lady Ethelfled. And that night, the whole city of Chester, the English and the Irish Vikings, celebrated the wisdom of Lady Ethelfled. It's a fantastic story, isn't it? I absolutely love Ethel Fled. She was one of my favorite characters, I think, from the Anglo-Saxon period. There are loads of stories about her. And I suppose this is one of those stories where the reality of it is maybe a little bit dubious. I don't know, it could have happened. It definitely could have happened. But the very fact that people wanted to tell that story back then shows us a lot. It shows us, for starters, that the people of Mercia really did care about their queen. Also, it shows us that there was, again, this idea of starting to work with others, even as far back then. This was only a few years after Alfred had died. So already the Angles and the Saxons were starting to work together and beginning this concept of the English, but here you have them also welcoming the Irish into the walls of Chester, still keeping the Danes out, but let's be fair, they were trying to take over the place. So it's still, I think, a wonderful story for showing that whether it's true or not, the people back then did really care and see the value of working together, bringing different sides in. I mean, how much did you enjoy that story, John? I love that story. Um, it, one, I mean, it, it's an early story of a queen, which mm. makes it important. Absolutely. Uh, the, uh, I mean, it's kind of strange, isn't it, that, that, that were amongst the strongest characters in English history have been queens. Uh, mm. So, uh, and, uh, and, yet, uh, 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 and yet it's taken... You know, whether whether I approve them or not, it's irrelevant. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, but, you know, Queen Elizabeth the First, Queen 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 Victoria, Queen, mm. uh, and then the whole new Elizabethan thing that I grew up with, um, and yet the the equality for women has taken so much longer. Um, you know, it's almost mm. like uh, like reality has taken a little while to ca catch up with the folklore. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see you're absolutely right. And I think, but this is how it works, isn't it? We have the movement of the people, people starting to sense these values, and that eventually filters through to the leaders. And it then eventually becomes something that everybody just accepts that, I mean, it, I suppose it, there's a phase. Well, it, it, I mean, within well. historically, um, just to, it's, um, there have been times when, there's been historically there, where there's been choices, mm. uh, like the Synod of Whitby. I think it, it's where the, they decide whether they're going to go with uh, the Christianity of Saint Augustus or Iona, and they went with Augustus because it came down from kings, and the mm. Iona one came up from the people. So it's been a bit ebb and flow through through the time. Um, but it but, but, been. but it's it, it's been working consistently, you know, and uh, the and it's almost that ten sixty six and all that good king bad king, you know, mm. bad kings bad kings got a bit of butter. <laughs> But of course, we're going to be finding out very soon how Canute, the the man who made this proclamation that would eventually inspire laws like Magna Carta and in, in the long run, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, he could well have actually been one of those kings who responded to the mood of his people. He was very uh, attuned to the customs that they had. He had great admiration for Alfred and all the work he'd done. He could see how 
people spoke really highly of folks like Alfred and Ethel Flaird, and he wanted to emulate them. It's because he was trying, in a way, to be Alfred to his people that he ended up passing probably the very law that Alfred would have done if he'd been in the same situation. So I think, yes, you do have those moments where um, there are people in charge who aren't necessarily the people who should be in charge. But in the grand scheme of things, as the last 1,000 years have shown, it's maybe a bit of a wavy line, but it is, it is still an incline, isn't it? Do, do you feel that? Well, I'm, I'm a perpetual optimist, so yes. <laughs> um, uh, there's, uh, you know, and, uh, you know and, and, and when you think about those early kings, you know, we weren't that far away from a chieftain situation mm. where, and, and in a chieftain situation, a chieftain only keeps their power in so much as they reflect the will of the people. And, uh, and so in a lot of old stories, we get a lot about councils. Mm. And uh, and wise counsel and unwise counsel, and it's who pe it's just sometimes it's who those rulers have around them and where they and where those people come from. I mean, how mm. many folk tales do we know about a king to actually find out what's going on? That a king dresses up as you know as a poor person to go out and find out what's going on. So absolutely, and those, and, and those kings and queens that we have sympathetic spoke law coming down from are probably mm. ones that actually responded to the will to an extent of their people exactly exactly you're you're maybe giving away some of the stories that we've got coming up there john i'm sorry <laughs> I, I, I'm uh, <laughs> it's all right it's all right it's it's a fantastic period of history and and you're absolutely right one one of the things that surprised me when i started looking into it actually was how democratic the process of uh, electing a king was back then i mean we we tend to think now that a king or a queen is something that gets passed down through generations and there, there was an element of that. If you if you were of noble birth, then you stood a pretty good chance of being the next king or the next in line to the throne. But really, that only started in the the years between Alfred and Canute for the Anglo Saxons, and it really properly took off after 1066. Around about the time of Ethel Fled, it would actually have been more a council who were responding to the needs and the will of the people who decided who their leader was. Uh, ironically, in a way, it's actually more the case for the Danish. All of the Danish kings were elected without any regard to, to family. But again, if you had a, a, a family who, if, you, if your father was the king, you stood a pretty good chance of getting elected, but still, no, it wasn't guaranteed. You're making and me I feel like we're going backwards. Well, in, in a way, I mean, I think with, with Ethel Flaird, again, it, it shows that she really was a queen of the people because when her husband died, there could have been a decision of the council to say, let's get a new, let's get a new king in. Or I think they, they would have been more a lord because at that point they were, um, they were respecting the, uh, the Saxon kings down in Wessex. But then, uh, Ed, uh, Alfred had another son around at the time, Edward, who they could easily have brought in to be their king straight away. Um, they decided, no, they're going to stick with Ethel Fled. They had a deep respect for her. So, yeah, sometimes we've, we've gone back a little bit, um, but then there's been a bit of a surge forward again. I think it's important to look back at history and see those times when we've got it right also see those times when we've got it wrong and realize, well, hey, people have come through this before and every single time we get back to uh, maybe the democracy or the equality, we do add a little bit to it. And of course, that's yeah, happened I mean, before in the last hundred years. If you just think of what's happened in the last 150 yeah. years in terms exactly. of universal suffrage, and mm. now people are questioning the form of democracy that exists to see how it can be improved. That's right. And, uh, because it is not a constant, it's an illusionary to think it's but as a constant. It's mm. it's continually evolving. Well, John, democracy means of the people, I think. It's probably got some roots in there somewhere. I'm not a, a linguist or whatever the word is. But 
the reason I bring that up is because you are also a man of the people. You collect the the words that people use and cr turn them into works of art. How has equality been an important part of the, the work that you well, do? It, it, well, it kind of started almost from that basis that, uh, um, you know, I, I don't use the phrase giving people a voice. They already have a voice. But mm. it's but it's uh, it's allowing that voice to be it's it's creating the means for that voice to be heard. So, for instance, we did a project in Birmingham called Your Streets, Your Voices, and uh, I collected people's not just their memories but their dreams for the future. And uh, and as a result, the, and there's constants that came through. A lot of people talking about we need more parks. We need more parks. And it started a process. It, uh, obviously, they did more research, but it started a process um, in the council where an extra park became available in Birmingham around the area. Well, shall I just, I will, for the moment, I will read an example of stuff I've collected because I think history is happening all the time. And we are able to collect memories from people and that in itself is history so for instance recently a, a very old boot sale uh was uh, closed down in birmingham and it had been going it was one of the oldest markets in europe and it'd been going hundreds and hundreds possibly thousands of years and it was closed for redevelopment and we there was a big project happening there, and I went round and I collected what I, I went round and I just asked people to give me their memories. And so, and it's got some of these shout market shouts two pounds for your Kelvin Kleinies, one pound, one pound, or two pounds. I just got back from India, saw my family, I'd give them loads of money. Come on, come on, very cheap, come on. I once sold a piece of old wood to a man for £20. He didn't argue. He just gave me the money. I don't know what he wanted it for. We're from Romania near Moldavia. 50 pence here to clean it up. I've been coming here for 23 years. There used to be days when I'd bring in three vans and clear out. I got 5G large for one day's graft. This was my spot. I'd empty three vans on the floor. Everything 50p or three for a pound. You could make a grand for nothing. Uh, when, the, when the early entrance first came in, I put two pallets of pop on the floor. They'd be gone in minutes. I was the youngest trader here. I've been coming ever since I've been four. Now the council keeps putting the rents up. They're ripping us off, man. They run it like a boot sale and charge market prices. Now, that was the stall holders. This is a couple of the uh, of the people that came to buy. Clear me out. Clear me out. Come on. Come on. I remember the old markets in Birmingham. Rats everywhere. That was when I worked on the sites and you could walk into a pub and get a job anywhere. Then I walked on the, I worked on the railway. It was a complete dust house compared to the building sites. I was at Snow Hill when Beeching closed it. When it opened again, the Bell Street Market was over there and it had its roof blown off during the war. I've been coming there since it opened up 20 years ago. I've got a carrier for my bike here today. At, that, at the moment, I tie stuff to my handlebars. I swerve all over the place. I remember buying a box of watches for four, for a, four or five quid. There was a tuning port watch in there invented by, by Mark Hazel. They took one to the moon. I'll leave it to a children's hospital when I die. It's worth about 400 pounds. You can find anything in rubbish. It's a laugh. When you turn up, you don't know what you're going to go home with. If anything, I came out today to buy the set square and I bought it. This is the weirdest thing I bought today, this cigarette box. It's got a music box in the back playing Al Johnson. It was 50 pence. Unbelievably cheap. I'll get more for it than, for it than that, I hope. Sometimes you just rock up, have a cup of tea and rock off. Very good, please. Come on, come on. It's been going for years. They're going to close it soon as well. Come on, come on. So these are just just memories from people, from ordinary people. And uh, I collected Sunday memories because Sundays have changed, you know, I mean. And uh, so I, um, they were opening up the libraries on Sundays. And I, I just, uh, and this is just what people told me. Sunday walks and best frocks, long hours in bed. Breakfast cooked by the old man. 
rice, peas and chicken after church, roast dinners, horseradish sauce, Yorkshire puddings and more potatoes than you could eat. Visits from aunts and uncles, cousins and grandparents, trips to the seaside, having time to read the newspapers, coming home from Sunday school, clutching our stamps, cold winters and toasting crumpets on the range, boredom and the same old programmes on the radio. Family favourites, Billy Cotton banjos, raise a laugh and sing something simple. You weren't even allowed out to play, but we went on our bikes, on bike rides with our fathers or walked to the harbour and sat on upturned fishing boats, got up, drunk pints before lunch, took trains to Brighton after partying all night in Brixton, went to art galleries, museums, concert at the Royal Festival Hall, listened to the speakers at Hyde Park Corner. We sat around the radio as war was declared. And when the air, air raid sirens sounded, we went out to see if the planes were flying over or ran to the air, sh air raid shelter. It was a boiling hot day and the bells didn't ring for four years. Sundays, when we gathered fruit from the orchard, played tennis, and you could smell the barbecue all the way down the road. Sundays, when the fields were always golden and the sky was always blue. I'll just do one more example then, because it's, a, and this is, this is very, really unusual because what I did, and it's something you, we can all do when it's because, I mean, I developed a style where I wrote things down on a flip chart, but this is something anybody can do because most people have phones that they can record things on. So, and I've been trying where I live, where I've got a house. I should, uh, I should be spending more time there in Romania. I was started collecting stories from old people. My idea was to collect old folk tales, but what I got was memories. And, uh, and I was, but I was collecting them. I was recording them because I can't speak Romanian. And so I recorded them and then I got someone else to translate them. But I, I tried to keep to the, uh, you know, to, to the spirit of what I, what I, I was told. But, mm -hmm. um, and that, that's, you know, for a lot of that, you know, because a lot of children, the, the new arrivals are two generations in and, they, they'll be, you know, the, uh, part of equality is is keeping hold of your culture, and so they could, people can record their grandparents, record their parents' memories, and then then they'll have that, and they can tell their children, and maybe you know, uh, maybe you know, uh, after a few generations, you've got four sets of grandparents from different countries, and you know what a mon wonderful montage. So this is um. This part of this was collected from a 62 year old guy and, and someone nearly as old. And uh, the lake that it refers to was built in the 70s. Before the lake, before the road, before we had to open the windows to stop them shattering when they fired those cannons left over from the days of the Australian Hungarian Empire, but the Russians who looted all the food and livestock from the village and mined the roads, the people took shelter in the forest, and we worked for the sass. That's an old German word for like a squire. We were 12 years old, went to school for four hours a week. Our parents had hired us out for a year for the year. We lived in long wooden cabin, all us boys. One had the power of prophecy. We tried to tell the sass no good would come from making us work on festival days, especially those dedicated to St. Ilya, who creates storms and rains down fire on those who displease him. The boy with the power told the sass he would, if he forced them to work on a holiday, there would be a great storm and worse. But the sass was German and knew nothing of these things. Meanwhile, one of the old workers called on the saint to bring down fire on the three hayricks. No sooner has he uttered the words when dark clouds gathered above them and a bolt of lighting set fire to the first hayrick, still the sass forced them to work until another bolt of lighting lit up the sky and the second hayrick burst into flames. Only then did the sass give in and grant them their holiday. As for the boy with the power to predict the future, he was given special treatment and lived well in, in, on on the farm. Later in life, he predicted the coming of the lake when he saw the pond full of frogs and the coming of tractors pulling trees from the forest when he talked of carts pulled by chariots of fire. At 15, 
I worked in the forest. There were no chainsaws back then, just long two-handled swords. Saws. One of us lads on each end. If we were lucky, we'd be working near a pool in the roots of a huge tree in the Zinalo. Beautiful fairies would come to the pool to swim. They'd sing the most beautiful songs. They'd take off all their clothes to bathe. Us lad would hide behind the trees and watch him wonder. Sometimes we'd take their clothes and they'd cry. That was in the daylight. Nighttime was a different matter. We all slept in the middle of the forest in a big hut made of bross branch and branches with bark, tree bark for the roof. We were warned if Mama Paduri spoke to us, we must not answer, or she would steal our voices. One night we heard her calling. No one answered. I heard the door open. I was terrified. I heard stories of the hag all my life. I kept my eyes tight shut and she moved from bunk to bunk. I felt a tug at my feet. Still no one spoke or even stirred. After what seemed to be an age, we heard the door open and close. Outside, there was a blood curling, curling scream. She was gone. <laughs> and uh, so that, but what interests me about that was that was a mixture. There was a mixture of, you know, historical fact with, you know, that, 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 the stuff left over from earlier in the century that's still being used in the Second World War, you know, and um, and but how, what that did to ordinary, you know, it's like the procedure of Chester in some ways. Mm. It was talking about people leaving the village and hiding in the forest as an invading army came in, and and within you know within the history of that place, especially Transylvania, there's so many old stories. You know, where the Hungarians are coming, the Turks are coming, the Germans are coming. And, mm. you know, and, and it's so there's this perpetual theme runs through. And then mixed up with that is the folklore of Mama Paduri and, and, and so forth and, and, and calling to the saints. So and it's it is that and it's trying to get an, but it's but we can all collect those voices. You know, OK, mm. I weave them, you know, I've been weaving them for a while, but um, but. You know, the raw material is there. Just take that phone, put it on record, and go talk to people you know. They all. Well, I have to say, John, that I am absolutely gutted to have been kicked out while you were delivering those performances because obviously it's meant that I, I missed them. <laughs> I was really looking forward to listening to them. But before I forget and before any gremlins kick me out again, um, I do want to make sure that anybody watching this right now, um, be it at the World Storytelling Cafe, at kingdom1000.com uh, or Facebook, YouTube, anywhere it's showing, you can actually come in here and join John and I and, and the fly and Bianca and, and all of the gremlins. And you can put your questions to John in a little Q&A that's coming up. So if you have got a story to tell, and as you've heard from John, you, you do. Um, if you have a voice, which again, as you've heard from John, you do. Uh, you can ask for tips from, from John about how you can get this into your celebration of equality, how you can gather up your own words, maybe put them down on paper, maybe just figure out how to make them free flow and share what you feel, your feelings about the fact that equality and equal rights is 1,000 years old this year. To do that, just click on the little join meeting button, which you will find at the worldstorytellingcafe.com or kingdom1000.com. You'll come into this Zoom room and start popping your questions into the chat, anything you want to ask, and we will we will put them to John. Um, but can I, yes. can I make one more suggestion on on how, because not everyone can read lots of words, and there is a program called Comic Life, which means, and you can put a photograph and make a, a sequence of photographs with a bubble in and a few words. And what I found, it was, I was doing projects like this. And once I found was that um, it was almost a byproduct, was hmm. that kids who only spoke English could send these things to their grandparents who only spoke their mother tongue. But because there was a picture and just a few words and a, in, in a word bubble, they could communicate. And then, and, and it was a story and the same thing could be done back the other way. So Absolutely. there's an idea. 
That that is a brilliant idea, and that that's exactly what I was coming to ask you, actually, John. Was whether you had any other ideas for how people might be able to do this, how they might be able to take their stories, because I, I suppose one of the things that I missed. Sorry, everybody, if you've already heard John say this, but of the text that you were were reading, uh, how much of it was literally translating what people had told you? Mo, mo, the most I did one from Birmingham Market, and mm -hmm. I always try and stay as close as po possible to people's own words. Um, I mean, the Romanian one is a bit different because I, but it's only it's only on the joins between people. I sort of made an everyman of it, you gotcha. know. So I take two or three, of the, well, it was three people, and I I, I, I welded, but it was more welding, you know. The store, the words in between were. Uh, it was kind of like I had to because it was I, I, because of the translation I had to put it back into usable English. But, um, so th this is this is what you were suggesting to folks already, right? That they go out and maybe listen to stories, maybe record them on their phones, um, and then take them away, process them, put them in an order, and well, you sometimes doesn't even need an order because people oh, right. remember what. The, you know, people think something has to be huge. When mm. I do the memory collecting, people might give me one line. For instance, I, I was collecting in a prison, and I was asking about what, how people, um, sort of what happened at school, how you know what that that might be got them to that place. And I was on a prison wing, and I was surrounded by prisoners, and they were all the, but the great thing about this collecting is that people talk to each other as well mm. which is another thing it aids communication and one of the guys said i was in the sudan there was a civil war my dad was killed my sister was killed and i got a bullet in the stomach i couldn't see a lot of point in going to school after that and it was you know that so it's not always nice stuff but mm. that didn't need that didn't need a whole 200, you know, that's like 200 paragraphs in one. And I just wrote it down exactly as he said it. So they needn't be huge. Mm. So it's not a long thing. You know, maybe if someone just, you know, the, you know I mean, all, all old people, you know, repeat their stories anyway. You needn't mm. ask, just put, on the, just put on the microphone when, you know, instead of, oh, no, not this again. I think it's, oh, great, <laughs> you know, I can record it this time. Um, and if you I think can, my father is going to be really happy that I didn't say anything about him there. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so, um, so there's a, uh, and I mean, talking fathers, you know, I mean, like, as, when, as people are getting old and there's big gaps between the words, the great thing about technology, you know, if an idiot like me can actually handle it, and I don't know the first thing about computers. I sort of learn what I need for that moment. And I recorded my father and I and then I put it through some Adobe audition or something. And I took out the gaps between the words. And what I was left with was his voice as I thought of him, not this, you know. And and so, you know, as we we might think people are losing it, but they're just taking a while to find the words. So all these mm. things are important, and it also makes makes older people feel feel valued. I think it's just, and also, yeah. but I also combine this with people by their dreams. You know, like if it's not just memories, it's but if you were the rule, if you were the king, if you were Ethelfled, you know, what would you do? You know, if you ruled this place, what would be the first thing you did? And so it also validates people's visions as well Absolutely, as their memories. Yeah. yeah, and what I what I really love about everything that you've been talking about is just how accessible it is. Uh, and we were talking about this a little bit with Manju a couple of weeks ago, that th this is one of those arts which is absolutely accessible. It's not um, high literature that we're talking about here. It's people's voices. So, yes, you can be talking to the elderly. You can be talking to people with cognitive difficulties. You can also be talking to really small young ones, 
again, maybe with cognitive difficulties. You can be talking to teens who are going out and working really hard. You can maybe be talking to young carers and you can make it accessible and equal in that way. But you can also make it accessible and equal the other way too. So you mentioned essentially photo comic books, um, which it are a fantastic way of, I think, getting children to take part in activity like this. So they, they can hear some words, it's also, they can decide which words they like the sound of, turn them into speech bubbles, stick them on a photo. Uh, that's, that's a lovely idea. That the whole but what we also found when we did fathers, I did a lot of work with fathers and children because there were some people saying that the fathers had lost, were losing touch with their children, mm. mainly because we don't get the train sets anymore. You know, so when when we got the train sets, uh, you know, like dad would, you know, would use it and I'd eventually let the kid in. Um, and uh, there's a... But, Again, but my I dad did, probably the, happy if I don't say anything about him here. <laughs> so, uh, but but when I did the photo, the, the comic book projects, it was fathers and sons could work together. And so, uh, and, uh, and also usually the kids knew more about the computer than their dads mm. did. But you know the dads were always you know always giving advice on how to take the photo, and then uh, then they try and give advice on the computer. Um, but it was a thing; it's something that can be done together, mm. which I think is is really important. I really like those. I really like projects where people can do things together. Because Absolutely, yeah. I think I was mentioning to you, John, um, not too long ago that we did a very similar project. Uh, my storytelling friend Amy and I, we went into uh, an, uh, an elderly care home and did some reminiscent storytelling or, as you call it, memory work with them. So listening to the stories that they had to tell, taking some of their fantastic um, uh, narratives and, and some of their actual words and then we took their stories into a nearby primary school where the children heard the stories, worked with us to blend them into nice long epics. And then a musician came in and helped them to turn into ballads. Um, and then we went back to the elderly care home with all of the children and they sang the life stories of those residents to the residents so it was an ama it, i mean everybody was in tears by the end of it because you could see the the children were looking at their heroes these were real life heroes sat in front of them and the elderly were seeing the fact that they had passed on this amazing gift of their lives to children that they hardly even knew um but they they had planted a seed for future generations in the hedge you know all of the inspiring things that happened to them during world war ii and 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 other um the other years around it these were things now that those children weren't going to forget because they'd worked so closely with them created their characters in their head written and sang these songs it, it was an incredible experience but it shows how you can really bring entire communities together just through the power of talking which is essentially and, and, and what's marvelous what is that you can take it it's something that you can take as far as you like mm. you know you can either take it and just leave it as those few words uh, or or make a little cd or whatever you do now you wouldn't make a cd but um you'd put it and put it up in the cloud <laughs> uh, and uh, there's a uh, so it can be got for a uh, but, but for the future and you can do that at home or it can be part of that of a fantastic project like you do and mm. there's i mean and that's a true that's a truly egalitarian thing that it can be you know that, that there is a form that can be taken as far as you like you know you it, 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 i mean when you think of it kids are mixing between countries mm. musically i've seen kids making tracks um where there's a musician in Texas and another one in Belgium and another mm. one. Well, if we implant this idea um, or uh, someone takes it up, you could do the same thing, you know, a group of people around, you know, a family could do it across the world. You know, a family with some in Australia, some in uh, 
in America, some in the Caribbean, some in Romania, all those families could get together and create sort of not just a family photo album, but a family story. Yeah, you know, yeah absolutely. The, the possibilities are endless. They really are. And now I don't know whether it's because of the uh, the gremlins that are keeping people from entering uh, our Zoom room at the moment or whether it's just the gremlins that are stopping me from seeing people's questions. Um, if you if you are watching this and you want to have a go at uh, asking a question, please do um, click on uh, join meeting button at worldstorytellingcafe.com or kingdom1000.com. You'll come right in here and if there's anything that you want to ask, then at least try and put it in the chat. And um, unless uh, unless the gremlins get in the way, I, I will be able to see your question. We've got some uh, very busy bees working in the background trying to help us with all of that. Thank One you, question that I would like to um, pose to you, John, um, while we're waiting to see if any if anybody's able to get a question through, is um, obviously you and I, this is our livelihood. Um, so we are quite, I think, brazen when it comes to going up to people and inviting stories from them. And there's a wonderful, I don't know if you, you know Del, Del Reed, don't you? Mm, yeah. Um, Del has, uh, Del is another storyteller who's based down in London. And he has the amazing stories of how he's just sitting in a bar and people come up and they just tell him stories. He, he just has a look of someone who you want to tell a story to. So a lot of the, the times he's telling real life stories, they're stories that people have just given to him as a gift. Um, just, just. Well, off, I, off I, I had something very similar in, yeah. in Malden. Um, early on, before I decided to be a storyteller, I, I wanted to write a book about a time traveller. So I dressed up as a medieval peddler and I walked around oh, wow. East Anglia. Um, I did two walks, one up to Tat Ipswich to Tattington in Norfolk and one down into to, through Essex. And I got to Tiptree. It was very real. You know, the, in, the inns became real places. You were very thirsty by the time you got there. So I'd walk in and uh, I'd walk in a medieval costume into an inn um, because I was living at 24 hours a day and I wasn't accepting lifts or anything. And mm. I'd walk up and there was a ritual almost. I'd buy my first pint and the second pint of beer someone would buy for me. And then they'd start talking. And I, in, in, in Tiptree, which is near Malden, there was... Uh, and... He said he'd been a road, um, uh, he a road builder, hmm. and he was, and they were digging down, and then he started talking about the archaeological finds that they they found, and from that he started telling me about um, uh, the Battle of Malden. And he'd say, "You see those woods up there, boy?" He says, "That's where we run when the when the Vikings come," <laughs> and uh, there's a uh, you know, and and it was. You know this kind of folk history of that area, you know that was that was almost in the soil. Mm. You know that 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 the the stuff he found building a brand new dual carriageway had reminded that, and the fact that I walked in in this weird, got weird costume, sort of. And uh, but I think you know there's uh, it, it's um, but we get used to talking to people, and it comes I think from Del and my generation. It comes because we did talk to people. My dad, when, I, when we were out on our cycle rides, my mm. dad used to, whoever we were passing would go, good morning, and raise his hat. And, uh, a, and I, you know, and if I that, didn't... That was going to be my question, John, because you're, you're right. I think for, for folks like you and for um, even for folks like me, um, it, it's quite easy to go up and start conversations or, or attract conversations. For for anybody who's watching this and thinking, well, I'd, I'd quite like to collect memories, but I'm not entirely sure where to start. How how do you think they could get the the gumption to go out, or where enough. could they start? That would be an easy easy way to get started. Well, I think you know, like you know, everyone knows a range of adults, and most people, if you ask people for a memory, a stranger for a memory, or someone you know. 
you know, a good question is, what was it like when you first moved here? Because mm. people remember their first week, you know, the first day or the first week of when they when they came somewhere. And what you end up with in the end, if you've got a range of ages, is you and and, and ages can only be you know might only be five years apart, is that you end up with a picture of a town, because as as it grew as as because mm. those those early memories and it's a really it's um. I mean, I think the important thing is to have open questions where you're not predicting anything. So I, I used to write on a, a flip chart. I'm not suggesting everyone does this. You know, I mean, I dressed up my top hat and my lunacy. Um, strange enough, people talk to costume characters. Um, and, uh, you know, I think if I walked up people in a jeans and T-shirt, they'd probably call a constable. But um, the uh, – and I just write, I remember – and then I just do, but we can do the same, the same thing with people we know. You can just mm -hmm. uh, do, either record or write it down. Just give me the first thing you remember when you first, when you first came here. Um, or, and as you said, it doesn't need to be a lengthy diatribe. It could just be one or two lines. sentences, one or two lines, one or two words. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, and it needn't be written down. It's, I mean, I, I again, I, I keep talking about, uh, the, 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 my stuff in Romania because um because there's a school when I go there there's a school that always invites me in mm. and uh, they one of the teachers there had done that with the pupils and they each brought in uh, a story that they collected from their grandmother and some mm. of them were only five lines long um but really really great stories um and and they, they a lot of those were folklore obviously. Legend, mm. and uh, or something. Um, yeah, Bianca always laughs. So, you know, I try, I know it's spelled, but I always, <laughs> you know, I speak Essex Romanian. <laughs> Bianca, uh, by the way, is one of the um, good gremlins who is helping us uh, at the World Storytelling Cafe at the moment, trying to hold it all together. It yeah. looks like uh, if people are asking questions, John, none of them are, are getting through to me, which is... Can I ask you a question? Uh, well, if you want to. Yeah, that story you told... It's going to be in the next edition of the book, isn't it? Um, uh, oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, is, when is that going to be available? Have we any idea when that's going to be available? Uh, that's a good question. Pe people don't know about this yet. So um, a lot of the stories that I'm telling here at kingdom1000.com are stories from a book that I wrote called Who Made England? Uh, it's a lot of the folklore from the time. There are other stories about these characters there. And it was available in the shops for um, a couple of years, but then Kingdom 1000 happened and we decided to update the book. So it's going to be launched a bit later on this month and we'll, we'll let everybody know. We'll certainly let you know, John, but we'll let everybody know that that book is available if you want to get even more of the stories, the folklore and the history behind kingdom1000.com. Thank you for giving me the chance to mention it, John. Yeah. And you know, and I think the other thing to do is that maybe not now or maybe even now, you know, like what do people remember at the beginning of lockdown? You know, because mm. there is a whole story definitely to be, to be you know, and this will be a story that they, you know, the young people or all people are living, you know, this is a moment of, of living history. Mm. You know, it, it, uh, that will. It really is. And it's one where equality is kind of ingrained as well because it's happening all over you know everybody is going through the same yeah. confusion and uncertainty at the moment so yeah that that's that's definitely yeah. so, so there'll be sad that. stories there'll be there'll be triumphant stories just Absolutely. like in any other extreme circumstance and and so you know and and even you know if you can write a diary Oh, mm. talk a diary. Talk talking a diary is good. I mean, that, like diary, John has already said, video this is diaries, so easy to everything. Do these days. Um, you know, one of the you know, um, and and the other great thing that's happening now, which not not necessarily lockdown, but you see, it, it, on Facebook, 
when people on these memory things from towns, someone puts up a photograph of a town and says, who remembers this? And sometimes mm. it's got a shop in. And sometimes says, I remember Mr. So-and-so who owned that shop. And someone says, yeah, my granny used to always go in there. Yeah, I remember mm. that. I, he used to give me tuppence worth of sweets or something. That's and, right. Social yeah. media could be a mine for this sort of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, that you you don't even have to go and talk to people. You know, you could just you could just look in the local Facebook thing of your because that's ephem Facebook's ephemeral. You know, once it's gone, you know, you uh, you can find it, you can mine it. But, you know, most times you see it. But if you think, you know, go to your town Facebook page, whatever it is that people send stuff into. You know, it's you, uh, public group, private group, doesn't matter, but do it. And you can just make those notes, keep the photo, and just even work a story from that photo of the things people put up. So. That's it. Don't, you don't actually have to go up and talk to people. You know, it's a way for those people who really don't want to. Mm. I mean, some of us are very private. And I think this is the whole thing. When we create things like this, as you quite rightly say, it's easy for you and me, but we have to make it accessible for everyone. And, Absolutely. And, and, and Absolutely. it's just like, find the bit that you're comfortable. I think that's the thing. Find the bit you're comfortable with. Hmm. Well, there you are, folks. I mean, you've got so much, I hope, from this episode of Kingdom 1000. I mean, John has given you some wonderful examples of how this has worked uh, for him and the sorts of things that he's done. You've had the example from Chester over 1000 years ago of how that story was taken and retold. But if you hear stories from anywhere be it on social media from your own family i mean there, there's an easy place to start isn't it just just ask your own family or clubs that you're involved with just a simple question like john said and get a few words in perhaps that's going to inspire you to do some sort of illustr illustrative collage maybe get some pictures to go with the words maybe do a little video maybe just write the words down as a poem maybe perform it there are all sorts of ways that you can use the memories of life all around us to create works of art and once you've done that if you go to 1000.com and pop it up on there everyone else will be able to see how you are helping us to celebrate 1000 years towards this journey of equal rights and human rights that we are on right now. You can celebrate with us and see all of the others that you are celebrating with too and bring a real community to this. Help us to make it really strong. While you're there at kingdom1000.com, you'll also see a little button that's asking you if you'd like to make a donation. And if you do, all of the money that you donate is going to the Youth for Human Rights International, a really important organization that is helping educators around the world to share the messages of equal rights, human rights, and in particular, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it is my real pleasure to announce that next week we're going to have a slightly different episode because not only are we going to get our first glimpse of the actual document, the actual law, from 1,000 years ago that we are celebrating right now. But we are then going to be joined by the president of Youth for Human Rights International, Mary Shuttleworth herself. So that's going to be our guest next week. And really hoping we don't have any gremlins then, at least once again, with the help of Bianca here, we have managed to uh, squash a few more gremlins. So we'll, we'll be guarded against them for next week. I'm really sorry if you have been here in the World Storytelling Cafe, you've tried asking a question and it hasn't come through. I've been able to see that there are people here, but sadly the questions haven't come through. So really sorry if you, you tried and, and I guess the various gremlins that were around earlier may have messed up with that somehow. But thank you very much for joining us. Thank you wherever you are watching. I'm going to give John an opportunity to say cheerio as well. Well, thank you, everybody, and thank you, Chip. It's been a great opportunity uh, to rattle on. I do like to rattle <laughs> on. <laughs> like I said, we if if we were going to have gremlins kick me out of the room, at least you were here. You were the perfect person to be here in my place. Thank you, Chip.
Thank you for thank you for everything that you're doing, John. Um, looking after folks like me and anyone else who comes into the storytelling world, I think you epitomize the storytelling community for a lot of us because that that's exactly what storytelling is about. It's about sharing. It's about not not the person who's doing the talking, but everybody who is listening. And I don't think anybody uh, represents that as clearly as you. So thank you ever so much for joining us this week. And with that in mind, I think it's time for us to start looking forward to next week. Again, thank you all ever so much. It's been wonderful having you here and I look forward to seeing you next week. Cheerio. Cheerio.